say this morning. Use your reactions button just to get, tell me how you're doing. I don't, there's all kinds of options there. I'm doing okay. I'm doing a thumbs up. Let's see, we have actually Nelson, I think, was going to do an introduction. Sorry. Yes, if we're through with our intro to art class and uh, other technical details, welcome to Adult Forum. Uh, thank you for bearing with us again as we explore some of the technology options that we have. Some of you have already met Mindy Erdman. She is the intern to the congregation this year. She is a senior in the Masters in Divinity program at Duke Divinity School. We're happy to have her with us. Uh, some of you already know her, Fred. Starting in two weeks, she will be leading the Bible study class for 10 weeks, studying the book of Jeremiah this fall. Uh, in addition to that, she'll also be working with us on the, the topic of racial justice, uh, a, a focus or a theme for us this year. Um, prior to, or, in her earlier life, she was a math teacher. Uh, she may have transforms in linear algebra class, so that might be part of her title for today, transformative Bible study. Uh, uh, she has been a uh, staff for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And in addition to all of these interesting things, uh, she is the wife of Mark, an art conservator and the mother to Isaac and Isaiah. Welcome, Mindy. We look forward to being transformed. Thank you, Nelson. Um, if I, I may have met some of you um, in person if you've come to the chapel and I won't recognize you um, between a computer screen and a mask and all of that. So if you see me in person, just introduce yourself <laughs> um, so that I, can maybe start to put some names to faces or at least some names to eyes and foreheads. Um, I'm going to try, this is another sort of um, test run, but I'm gonna try to divide us into breakout rooms and the people in the room here can be a, a room, a breakout room. Um, I'm gonna try to put you in groups of two to three. And in that group, I have an assignment. I want you to describe your worst Bible study experience using one word, you don't have to be sticklers, but try to think of one word to describe your worst Bible study experience and one word to describe your best Bible study experience. And this is in a group. So with a, if a group Bible study setting, a word to describe your worst experience and to describe your best. And I'm going to try to do the breakouts, which I have not done before. All right. <clears throat> Sorry trying to deal with two chats. Dull and lightning. Okay, well, thank you all. I hope that that breakout went okay because we're gonna try that again in a bit. Um, oh, engaging, that's good. Um, in the meantime, so I wanna, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to my own uh, journey with scripture and then we're going to talk about a type of study that I've done in groups that we've called communal discovery. So this is an intervarsity thing. Um, I love the way intervarsity approaches scripture um, and I feel like my most transformative and life-giving and engaging studies have been um, through intervarsity. So I um, want to share that with others that, that didn't have that opportunity. So my, I, I became a Christian. I decided um, as a teenager to follow Jesus. And immediately I went on a youth group trip driving from Cleveland or from Southern Ohio to Michigan. So six or eight hours in the car with a bunch of teenagers in the back of a van. And for some reason we decided to open the book of Revelation. You know, it was the weirdest book in the Bible and we were all teenagers. So we, um, we started studying Revelation and I had this brand new study Bible that I had just gotten because I was excited about my new faith journey and 
it had all these cross references in the middle of the page and i i was flipping back and forth you know this this strange book at the end of the bible had all these connections to genesis and psalms and the gospels and um i was just fascinated i was just immediately hooked that this weird book at the end of the bible actually had things that tied the whole thing together and I think since then I've been in love with the Bible and also have wanted to understand it as that unified story or um, unified book. It's not um, just a bunch of individual things, but it tells this whole story and it's all interconnected. So I ended up getting involved with InterVarsity right after, uh, right when I went to college and learned more about, about the Bible, about how to study the Bible. Eventually I went on staff with InterVarsity and my job title was scripture engagement and racial justice specialist. So I was training student leaders and staff on how to study and lead Bible study. I was um, working with chapters and, and chapter staff to engage the campus in all of its diversity and also to um, particularly to help white students understand why we were talking so much about race, because many were coming from backgrounds where it wasn't discussed and it wasn't seen as related to their faith. And um, so that was, that's kind of my journey. Eventually I, I came to Duke because I wanted to do that same kind of thing in churches, um, helping churches engage with scripture in life giving ways and in ways that will help uh, us um, recognize the need to deal with, in our current moment especially, um, know how to talk about race and understand what is at stake with that and how it connects to our faith. So that's what brings me here. This um, internship was just sounded like the perfect opportunity to do those things that I, um, that I love. And so that's why I'm here. Um, I, come from so my my background my my faith journey i really grew as a christian within intervarsity which is an evangelical organization so i have um some issues with the whole evangelicalism <laughs> i think um some of you may know how that how that is um there's just a lot of uh, a lot that's been done i think amy and amy was telling me about this earlier <laughs> so um but what I do um, hold on to from that tradition is a high view of scripture as the living and active word of God. Um, I really believe that Bible study is meant to transform us. It's more about transformation than it is about information. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us as we engage in the word of God. I think it's, um, it's not as much of we're going to the Bible to find the answers. Um, it's more when we take time to engage with scripture, it gives us space for God to speak to us in the moment. Um, and with this communal Bible study method, it, it, that happens in a community. I, I think most Bible studies I was a part of before InterVarsity, it was a bunch of individuals coming together to study together, but it was usually individual sort of application or individual growth that happened. Everyone went home to their own life and they kind of applied it, however. But I've seen through InterVarsity um, just an amazing way of bringing community together and, and having God speak to a group of people, which most of scripture was meant to be um, shared in a community. It was their letters to churches, their stories of the people. So um, that's something I've loved about about this communal discovery Bible method. Um, I think I've mentioned some of these things, but just again, I don't, the Bible's not an instruction manual. I think sometimes it's easy to think of it that way, but it's, it's living and active and it's a story. Um, there's instructions in there, but I don't think that that's ultimately what the Bible is. Um, and I, I think it's most transformative when we approach it as an opportunity to interact with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit transform us. Um, something else I've noticed, and I don't know if any of you will resonate with this, but I think in a lot of churches, Bible study or the Bible has become sort of a spectator sport. We rely on pastors and experts to tell us what it means. 
but I think very few churches or very few Christians have had an opportunity to learn how to engage personally with scripture. And so we leave it up to the experts. Um, that, and that could be because we feel like there's a lot of historical context we don't know or, um, or that sort of thing. But I, I really want to help Christians know how to engage together in community and engage on your own without feeling like you have to ask an expert, what does this mean? Um, I think that the education that experts have, I mean, clearly I'm getting my education <laughs> to have some of that expertise, but I don't think, I, I, the Bible is, you know, this very reformation, you know, the, the Bible is for the people and we, we all, I hope, can learn how to engage with it well. Um, all right, before I move on, on, I will give an opportunity for anyone to ask any questions or make any comments about so far what we've done. You can go ahead and use the raise hand feature and I will um, call on you and then you can unmute if you have a comment or a question, or you can put it in the chat if you'd rather do that. Me from the room. All right, um, we'll move on. Please feel free to write anything in the chat as we go, if there's a question or if you need me to slow down or anything. So I'm gonna share, let's make sure I have all my documents here. I'm gonna share a handout. If we were in person and some of us are here, actually I have copies for those that are here. Um, we, yes, we would each get a hard copy of this. But. Um, but I'm going to share share it on the screen. Uh, all right. So I'm going to go through this, and I know that when I'm sharing the screen, it can be hard to see chats and stuff, so, and, and I can't see all of your your faces. Um, so I'm going to try to, okay, thanks. Nathan's going to, Nathaniel's going to keep track of if there's any questions or anything. So, all right. So the first, first key to this is um, I love studying scripture inductively. And if it, you, some of you might already be familiar with that idea or that word. So it, inductive study is different than deductive study. And I think often Bible study guides and stuff are more deductive. They have the, 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 the guide or the teacher knows where they want you to go and they're just gonna make sure you get there. Um, another way to think of deductive study is if you wanna learn about prayer. So you look in a concordance and find all the instances of the word prayer in scripture and you go and you look at what does the Bible say about prayer? Um, I don't think that's bad. I think there could be great um, reasons to do that. But what ha can happen if we're only doing deductive study is then we might look at something like the Lord's Prayer and think the only thing that that is is about prayer and we'll miss that there's actually lots of other stuff to learn from that passage. So we, if we come to a passage thinking I'm going to learn about prayer from this passage, we're, we might miss what else is there. So that's why I like to make sure you have a balance between deductive and inductive study. Um, this little table um, kind of gives you the, some of the contrasts and comparisons. A, dedu a deductive study is more like a prosecutor. So a prosecutor, um, they know that they want to prove that something happened, that they want to prove something happened. So they're going to go and find all of the evidence that points to that thing having happened. And that's the evidence they're going to focus on. Um, a detective goes into a setting and observes. No, a detective shouldn't have any preconceived ideas of what happened. They're going to go into the, the, the scene of the crime and they're going to look at what clues do they see, what evidence do they see, and then they're going to put all of that together to come to the conclusion. So inductive study is more like we're, we're being detectives in the scripture rather than prosecutors. Um, a deductive study starts with the main point and uses the text to support that point. Um, but an inductive study starts with observing the text in order to discover what the main point is. Um, 
found that observation is one of the hardest things for people to get used to because we want to jump right to the meaning. We want to make meaning out of it right away. And we often miss what's there. Um, deductive study, uh, student must depend on a teacher or an expert who's already done the work and decided what this is about. Um, but inductive study, um, the student depends on the text and the Holy Spirit and the community to come to a conclusion about what's, um, what God has for us in this passage. Um, in a deductive study, people learn from listening to someone else's data um, and, and listens to them share their conclusions. But in an inductive study, people learn from asking questions and internalizing the data and then drawing their own conclusions. Um, this, there's been a lot of research on how adults learn things. And one of the keys is that adults learn things best when they ask the questions. So many Bible study guides have the questions written, but if those questions aren't really the ones you're asking about the passage, it's not going to really internalize what's happening. But if, if we're developing the questions and asking the questions and wrestling with those ourselves, then it'll um, be more effective in, in really um, having the word sink into our hearts. Um, with deductive studies, often um, because it doesn't have that chance to really sink in, um, it the the information leaves leaves you almost as soon as the teaching time is over. But with inductive study, lessons can really stay because they're really internalized. Um, and students have, or Bible study, study student studiers have shared with others. They've done it in community often. And so that's um, just more likely then that that lesson is gonna really lead to transformation. Um, the steps of an inductive study. So these steps can be used in individual study and also in group study. The three main steps of inductive study are first observation, like I mentioned. And when you're observing, um, you're looking at things in the, in the text. I, I didn't, it's through inductive study that I realized how beautiful and um, amazing the literary um, quality of scripture is. It, the, these, the people that wrote this down were artists who, who wrote things in a way that um, brings meaning not just with the words and the content, but the ways that they've decided to put the story together. And, and making observations helps us to kind of see some of that. So we're looking for um, things like context and a little bit of historical context can be helpful, but also if you're looking, today we're gonna look at a passage in Luke eight. So understanding what happened just before in Luke seven and then what might come after that can help you to sort of place yourself in the story. You're looking for who's there in the story, basic newspaper, you know, news reporter questions, who, what, where, when. You're looking for any repeated words or ideas uh, and cause and effect within this story or the passage, um, comparison and contrast. And then one of the really important things, as I mentioned earlier, is the questions. So I I know that some people are raised with the Bible to not ask questions of it. It's this is what it says. We believe it. That's it. But it's in asking the questions that the real transformation happens. So during the observation part of the study, you can note down, write down any questions that you have, something that doesn't make sense to you, something that sounds just not in line with what you would what you would have thought, um, things that surprise you, those kinds of things. Um, so once the observation time is done, then you move into interpretation. So we don't wanna jump right to deciding what it means. Uh, we want to use our observations to then start answering our questions. Um, one important thing with inductive study is to try to answer the questions from the text itself that you're studying or from the book of the Bible. You, at, at least at the beginning, we don't want to jump to other parts of scripture, especially parts that the original hearers wouldn't have had access to. So a lot of the New Testament, we can go back to Old Testament scripture because the first readers or first hearers would have had that. Um, but trying not to go into other letters or other parts of the New Testament because the original hearers wouldn't have had access to those. And they would have had to make meaning of the text just with what they had in front of them. 
And through interpretation, we're, we're wanting to figure out what's, what's the main point of this passage? What do we learn about God? Or in a more sort of um, here and now moment, what is God saying to us in this moment through this passage? So first step observation, second step interpretation, and third step is application, um, which is just asking the question, how should we respond? If this is what the Holy Spirit's saying to us in this moment, is there something I should do about it? Um, I don't think it has to be like an action. Like I'm really, I'm really terrible at like setting goals and like being really concrete about what I want to do next. But I do um, think it's helpful to consider how might I think differently about something? Um, how might I think about God differently? Or how might what, how what might this lead me into worship? Um, those kinds of things. All right, so that's those are the three steps of inductive study. That's something, like I said, you can do on your own. Um, I can make this um, page available um, to you if you wanted to download it and use it later. Um, I'm going to pause there before I move on and ask if there's any questions at this point. You see any on the chat? All right. I, oh, I see Amy and Miguel raise their hand. Go ahead and unmute. Okay. So um, this is Miguel. So just a, a question. So from what I see here, and, and I'd gotten the sheet before, a little earlier before the class, so I had a chance to look it over. But um, I, see, I see potential for uh you know reading a passage and then you would discuss it with others i imagine it's this is almost a community activity and then how would you uh reconcile differences in interpretation not only from what reading but from the different versions of bibles out there there's so many uh uh, uh what do you call them translations so um you know i'm not i i don't I haven't gone to many Bible studies, so this is fairly new to me. So I don't have a lot of experience necessarily, but I can an anticipate a lot of dis disagreements. <laughs> How would that be addressed, I guess? And That's an excellent question, excellent point. Um, so a few things, I, I would say one part of the joy that I found in Bible study is wrestling with those disagreements. Um, and and that's why it's important to keep in the text too. So you, if, if somebody's saying something that you don't agree with, you can say, well, where do you see that in the text? How, you know, what's the evidence from this? How does that, how does this text lead you to that conclusion? Um, even if you're doing this on your own, I, I mean, I am a huge proponent of reading many different translations, but also different interpretations of different passages and, and being comfortable with, in some cases, we're just not, ever going to agree. <laughs> um, so there might be, it might be an agree to disagree thing. Um, the other thing is I really, I really think, so I've done this mostly in the context of other Christians who've, who, who have the same view of scripture that in, in that it is God's word. Um, and there's a way that the Holy Spirit speaks to the group in a way that may not bring total agreement, but at least you can say, okay, so we have these questions that we haven't answered, but here's what we do know. Here's some things we can agree on. And as a community, um, focus on the, like God is speaking in that moment to those things that you do agree on. Um, I think ambiguity and stuff is, is sometimes hard for us to live with, but that's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need each other. <laughs> Thanks. <Yep. laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna move on before we get, oh, I see another couple of hands. Emily. I was just gonna ask about um, with, the, with the prophecies in the Old Testament, how how do you um, like a lot of times I'll read the Old Testament 
and I will look forward and I'll see um, the alluding to things, I feel like, in the New Testament. Um, but when you're saying to stay in the text, how, how does that work? And would you recommend not doing that? Like in your experience, how has that worked? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question too. Um, so I think we, as Christians, we tend to view the Old Testament almost exclusively through the lens of the New Testament. We've just been taught that. And I, I know many who've even been sort of taught that the Old Testament isn't really valid anymore, almost. Um, in my Old Testament class here at Duke, I, I remember the professor saying, we need to be able to look both directions. So we need to be able to look from the Old Testament towards the New, but also from the New Testament towards the Old. And if we haven't looked at the Old Testament for what it said at the time, we're not gonna be able to, when Jesus quotes scripture, when Paul quotes scripture, we need to understand what the hearers would have thought or you know how what that what would have evoked in them um so i think there is a place for looking forward and recognizing that okay isaiah 53 is you know it, it seems so clearly about jesus dying on the cross the suffering servant and all of that um and i think we can say that that's valid but i think we have to also consider what would the original hearers have thought of that before jesus came what what would that have invoked for them um so yeah i do think you need to go both ways but i think that christians tend to go more let's look at the old testament through the lens of the new um, instead of looking at the new testament through the lens of the old um and i so i lean more to, i love the old testament i lean more towards studying the old testament um which is why I'm excited about Jeremiah, but yeah, does that answer your question, Emily? It does, yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. If you wanna, those of you who've asked, if you wanna put your hands down, I don't know if I can do that, but if under reactions, you can, excellent. All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm hoping we're going to have a little, at least a little time to study Luke, but I wanted to just make some points about this communal um, discovery. So like I said, this inductive study is a method. You can use that in lots of different ways, um, but doing it as a community and not just reading it in a community to apply individually, but as a community, I just wanted to say a few words about that. Um, in that process, the, so the, the leader, um, I do think it's important to have a leader who's able to um, have a sense of where the Holy Spirit's taking the group. And so I know for some people, they feel uncomfortable with this type of study in a group because it kind of feels like, oh, anything goes, we're reaching our own conclusions. We can, um, and while I don't think we always have to agree, I do think that there's discernment that needs to happen about um, where the Holy Spirit is taking us. But part of how the, the leader does that is in first doing their own preparation, but then also making sure that the whole group has an opportunity to share their questions and their observations. So it's, I know for me, I don't know, I know everyone's not like this. I, I am a external processor. If I don't have the chance to say it, I, it's, I'm not gonna remember it. And so having the opportunity to speak in a Bible study is really important for me. So, which is why Bible studies is just one person teaching and just a lecture style, that for me is frustrating because I need to discuss it in order to really know it. Um, and I know that in, a, in some groups where you have a lot of people, you have a lot of um, different levels of experience with the Bible, you have some who, you know, pastors, they've been to seminary and then others who this is very new. And often the pastors wanna, wanna jump in and say, oh, here's what this means. Here's, here, let me explain this to you. Um, and that cuts off the process of the community from, from engaging. So um, again, it's not about information, it's about transformation. And so if we jump in too quickly, those of us who like to talk a lot <laughs> and say, here's what this means, um, we've cut off that process for the community to come to some conclusions and allowing others to share um, questions and observations that maybe you know, might point out things that you haven't seen before. Um, so I, it's it's an it's a really important thing to have the whole community involved in asking the questions, 
coming up with the ideas, even if I already think I know where it's going, giving others the opportunity to articulate that um, is really important. So as we um, go into our Jeremiah study in a couple of weeks, if those of you that are gonna participate in that, just keep that in mind that this is as a communal experience, we wanna give everybody a chance to share their questions, to share their observations. Um, and again, I think I've said every all the other things I had on my notes here to say, but we, we the expectation is that God is going to speak to us as a group, um, and that we're not we're not looking at the text together to figure out what it means per se, um, but we're coming together to listen to God and to hear what God has to say for us in this time and this place to this group of people. Um, before we jump into a very brief, <laughs> abbreviated uh, communal discovery study of this passage in Luke, um, I'll give you one more chance to, um, for any questions up, up at this point. All right, again, feel free. I think the panel is going to keep track of the chat. So if you have questions as we go forward, um, just put them in the chat and we will address them. All right. If we were um, in person, I would have everybody have a printed copy of the passage um, because I love doing it this way. So this is mine. I've already got it all marked up. It might be backwards too. I don't know, but. Um, oh, good. I, um, I really, I'm visual. I like color. I like interacting. So I, I love doing it with a manuscript like this. I when we, when we study Jeremiah together, I'm going to figure out some way to make sure that everybody has a hard copy of the passages that we're studying. So either if you have a printer at home, you can download it or we'll figure out a way to get, get that to people. For today, we're going to try using the whiteboard. Um, so First, let me see here. All right, I'm going to share the whiteboard and put the passage on there for us to see. Let me do this. Move to another page. All right, so this is Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. Um, did you have a, oh, good. Oh, yeah. That works, okay. All right. Um, I, oh yeah, let me give you, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of context for this, um, the literary kind of scripture context. So um, this is chapter eight of Luke and we've seen already seen Jesus um, traveling from town to town with his disciples. Um, they've been teaching, healing and casting out demons. So Jesus' disciples have been with him for a while. They've been doing all this together. Um, so the disciples have seen Jesus heal diseases. They've seen Jesus teach um, and with authority. So in, in earlier chapters, people commented on how surprised they were that he was speaking with such authority about the scriptures. Um, in chapter seven, we actually saw Jesus raising someone from the dead. So the disciples have seen Jesus do a lot of things already at this point in the story. Um, we've got people seeking Jesus out from all over the place coming to, to find him. So that brings us to this story in, in Luke 8. Um, if, is there, would anyone like to um, volunteer to read this passage for us? I'll do it. One day he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. 
A windstorm swept down on the lake and the boat was filling with water and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up shouting, master, master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed and said to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Thanks, Emily. So I am not sure. I wanted to put some things in the chat, but I'm not sure how to do that while sharing screen. Do you? If we can't figure it out quickly, we won't worry about it. No. Okay, that's all right. I won't. We won't. Hmm. That's all right. I won't worry about it. <laughs> um, I just want, I, I'll just remind you, I was going to write this in the chat, but just remember that when we're making observations, we're looking at things like comparing and contrasting, like contrasts in the text, cause and effect, anything that's repeated, words or ideas, um, and what characters are there, those types of things. Um, just as by way of illustration, I'm going to point one out myself to begin with and then I'm going to give you all a minute or two to look at your own on your own and see if you make any other observations. Um, so one thing is there's this contrast in verse 23 and I'm going to use my little highlight tool and I'm going to make it yellow um, that while the disciples were sailing Jesus was asleep. <laughs> so there's a contrast between what the disciples are doing and what Jesus is doing. Um, we're not going to do anything with that right now. We're not going to talk about it or figure out why, what that means. We're just going to observe, share it. It's out there. There's a contrast here. Um, just going to put those two together. So if you want to, um, I'm gonna have like 30 seconds or a minute of, of quiet for everyone to look at this on their own. And then we're gonna try breaking into pairs again to share some of our observations. Um, feel free to turn your camera off if you want while you look, we'll just do it one minute. Thank you. So while I think that was maybe about a minute, um, if you have a piece of paper to write down any questions you have about this passage, go ahead and write those down. Or if you just want to remember what they are, just think about what questions do you have. I think for the sake of time, rather than breaking us up again, um, I will just do this in the big group. So if you would like to share one of your observations, so we're going to save the questions for later, but if you want to share an observation, raise your hand and I'll call on you. And then if you want, you can try to mark it on the manuscript like I did um, using the annotate tools on the whiteboard, if you can find those. Um, if you don't, if you would rather not do that or, or can't find them, just let me know. I can try to mark it on here for you. Um, so go ahead and raise your hands if you'd like to share 
Any observations? Carl. Yeah, one thing I found interesting was the word rebuked. And that could be a, a matter of translation. I, I don't have my Greek with me, but um, usually we think of rebuke is, okay, you did something wrong. Somebody did something that was, that needs to be called out. And I'm, I'm rebuking that, that act was bad. In this case, you've got a storm happening, which happens all the time. I wonder, I wonder how much weight to put on that. That, that, you know, the problem, we would think of it most likely as the, well, the problem isn't wind and, and a storm. Those things happen. That's part of nature. It's too bad we were out in it. But I, I find that interesting that he woke up and rebuked the wind and raging waves. That's great. Yeah, that's good. So the strong language of that word is, is interesting. And that usually good observations lead to good questions. And so that's a good question we'll talk about later too, is what, why rebuke? Why choose to say it that way? The other thing is when he says, where is your faith? <clears throat> I, it, it's an interesting question to, to think of what should their reaction have been? Where is he saying you shouldn't worry about this? You know, I'm here or you should have have prayed and and done this. Mm -hmm. well, yep. What was he? What was the reaction from them? He was hoping to see. Yeah, good. Another good question. Um, what other observations does anyone have? And you can put your hands down when you. I don't know if I can do that for you, but oh yeah, I can. Good. Emily. You're still muted. You're still, oh, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so disciples and then master and master. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and then danger and calm. So danger and then calm. And then, um, they had faith and afraid. And then I also had the rebuking the winds and um, the raging waves. Good, so we've got some contrasts between disciple and master, danger and calm, um, faith and afraid, and then um, the perishing and, and they were afraid. That's, tell me again what the, um, observation was or the connection there was? Oh, um, faith and afraid. So to me, those are opposite, right? Because to, to have faith, you have complete confidence. And to be afraid is really the lack of confidence. So those two are opposites to me. Yeah, good. They didn't that yeah. Yeah. So Fran noticed that when they ask this, when Jesus asked them this question, they don't answer it. Um, Amelda in the chat um, notices a cause and effect between Jesus' words calming and calming the sea. Um, so he rebukes the wind. I'm, I know this is not the neatest thing. <laughs> it's hard to do on the screen, but um, yeah, there's a cause and effect there. Yeah, Amy or Miguel. So this is Amy. Um, just a simple thing. Um, it's not so much cause effect as simply a question. Um, the disciples in theory had been with Jesus for a while and seen him working miracles you know, healing and things like that. So it's a little interesting. They were afraid and amazed, but then said to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and water? It, eh, I don't think it's necessarily a, a pure identity question, but it's it's sort of interesting that, that something about this 
caught them by surprise that they wonder like, whoa, who is this? Eh. <laughs> yes, their response is interesting. <laughs> so for the sake of time, we only have like six minutes left. Usually this part of this next part of, so we, we've, We've shared a lot of our observations. I do want to um, make a list of the questions. This is why I asked you to write things down. I, I'm going to change the whiteboard, maybe, um, to the, a next, the next page so we can figure out, or we can write down all the questions. So um, let's see. Carl had asked why rebuke, right? Um, Amy was asking, why do the disciples respond the way they do? Were there other questions that you had? I'm, I know, I'm sorry, you can't see the passage anymore, but other questions? Yeah, you can feel free if you have, if you want to try to type in your own questions too, that's possible. Yeah, how was Jesus asleep during the storm? Jesus have wanted everyone to be asleep. Yeah. That's Amelda's question. Wider, yes, like, um, uh, now I can't figure it out. Once it's on there, I don't think I can. <laughs> oh, that's good. So Mel is wondering if the rebuke was because the, the storm was disturbing um, the calm of everyone in the boat. Um, I'll add that up here. I heard. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, there might be more questions. There's, I think, a good Bible study. There's always going to be more questions <laughs> than you can answer. Um, again, for the sake of time, since we finish up in four minutes, I'm, rather than actually do what we would normally do in a study, I'm going to tell you how it would normally go. Um, so usually I would have the group break up into two or, groups of two or three pairs because the smaller the group, the more opportunity there is for someone to speak and to you know share their thoughts. Um, so we would divide up into groups and then each group would take one or two of these questions that have been asked. So whichever one or two questions are really, I really wanna talk about this. I really wanna figure this out. And within your small group, you'd look at the text, you'd talk, talk it through, wrestle with it, not necessarily come to a strong conclusion, but um, in the process of wrestling and discussing the questions, there could be um, some, some insight that would come. And so after doing that in smaller groups, we'd come together and kind of go through the questions together as a group, um, hopefully leading us towards what often happens. And it's amazing is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to the groups and, and we end up sort of moving in the same direction um, with our discussions. And the person leading um, would would then, you know, listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the text, listening to the group would kind of summarize, here's what God seems to be saying to us in this moment. Um, and then we discuss that for a minute and then move into, so what should we do? What should our response to this be? Um, for this particular um, study, I, since we didn't really have the chance to, to discuss and to hear from everyone. So I'm going to share with you some of what I kind of, as I was preparing and studying where I felt like God was going with this. Um, and it has to do with this question about um, why the disciples respond the way they do. You know, they've, as I think Amy pointed out, they've, they've seen Jesus, they've, they've been with Jesus. 
so what's this question now? Who is this? Why are they asking this question now? Um, and something that might have come up in our discussion is that this is the first time that the disciples' lives themselves have been at stake. Like they really truly were in danger. They were scared for their own lives. So in this moment, all that they've seen Jesus do for others um, was now um, they're scared they're going to die. How, you know, how is Jesus going to let them? So this, it's, it's their own personal um, life that is involved here, um, which might be why they were scared. Because when it comes down to it, um, it's one thing to see God working in the lives of others, but another um, to trust that God will do the same in our own. Um, and I think another point is that even these men who are with Jesus and saw him doing these things, even they did not have a handle on who Jesus was. Jesus was beyond what they could figure out or understand or expect. Uh, so I think for us, um, I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. Jesus is always going to be more than we can, can hold onto, more than we can grasp. Um, on the one hand, I, there's, there's a balance between faith and knowing that Jesus loves us and will care for us. And on the other hand, a balance, balancing that with, if I ever think I've got Jesus figured out, <laughs> I might want to um, rethink that. Um, yeah, how could the human Jesus sleep um, during this storm, which would toss the boat about? Yeah, and, and another theme that comes up is Jesus is, very clearly we see Jesus as human because Jesus was tired and was asleep and we see Jesus as God having authority over the wind and the waves. So there's a lot in this little passage of only a few verses. Um, if we had had the chance to talk as a group, we might've had a sense of which of those things God might want, might've wanted to um, kind of bring out for us in this time. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, so I'm gonna end us with a quick word of prayer. Um, if you are intrigued by this type of Bible study and you wanna try it um, with the book of Jeremiah, we're gonna start that in two weeks. Um, feel free to email me or um, anything. If you have any questions or other thoughts on, on this morning, I'd love to connect with you. So let me pray and then um, we can finish up. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for speaking to us, not only through the words on the page, but through your spirit working among us. Um, even as we're all in different locations physically, your spirit um, connects and binds all of us together. And we pray that even in this passage today, you would speak to all of us who are on this call um, to help us um, just remember how amazing you are, um, that you are both human and divine, and that you um, invite us to trust you even in our own um, storms and, and raging seas. Pray blessing on the week for everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>